sing to me, oh muse. The Odyssey, an original adaptation written and retold for you by John Buckeridge. Chapter 14, Father and Son. The jar smashed. Antinous picked up another and hurled it to the floor too, then another for good measure. The Great Hall of Ithaca was always noisy these days, filled with dozens of feasting suitors as it was, but even with the hubbub one or two of them looked round to see him in surprise. You're letting them see too much, he told himself. Never show them weakness. He took a deep breath and calmed himself, offering his trademark icy smile to the suitors who'd noticed his outburst. So, you're telling me the pirates failed to take care of our problem, he hissed at his right-hand man. I'm afraid so, replied the chinless wonder the world called Eurymachus. I've heard mixed reports, but they seem to think the gods were involved somehow. There was talk of birds. Birds? rasped Antinous. Birds? What do I care for birds? The gods help those who help themselves first. That's the way it's always been. No, the pirates failed, and that's it. How many of the suitors were in on the plan? Well, all of them, said Eurymachus. For a moment, Antinous was taken back by that revelation. All of them were in on the plan to have the prince murdered? He asked in surprise. Well, yes, said Eurymachus. I don't think they necessarily dislike the lad, but they'd much rather it was one of us on the throne than anyone else. Antinous paused and did some mental reorganization of his ranking system with regard to the suitors. All of them had just been bumped up from bumbling freeloaders to ambitious freeloaders, and that also made them quite a bit more dangerous. Well, he said eventually, tell them it's time for a new plan, and we shall have to be a little more hands-on this time. Tomorrow is the Feast of Apollo, he'll surely be here for that, and when the feast is over, we can make our move. And once again, they bent their heads to plan. Little did they know that on the other side of the island, two other plotters were meeting and making plans of their own. On a little beach, on the south side of Ithaca, Odysseus knelt before the goddess Athena. Great Lady Athena, he said humbly, may I take this moment to thank you for all the help you have given me over the years. You have saved me more times than I can count. Thank you. It seemed paltry in comparison to all the help she had given, but it was all he had just now. Athena took it, though, with a graceful nod. You have always extolled the virtues I hold dear, Odysseus, son of Laertes. I have enjoyed having you on the mortal plane, and I am not yet ready for that to end. Even through the gratitude he felt for her, a small voice piped up inside him, pointing out that the words, I am not yet ready, could easily become... I am now ready, at a moment's notice. Tread lightly, Odysseus told himself, you are nothing but a favourite hound to her. I have brought you this far, Athena went on, but there is still further to go. Your house is under siege, and she told Odysseus of the suitors and the plots against Penelope and Telemachus. You must reclaim your kingdom, Odysseus, and you have no army or warriors to do it with. Odysseus was rocked on his feet. In all his years of trial and wandering, he'd never even thought that Ithaca would turn against him. Somehow, he'd kept it in a neat little corner of his mind, preserved and protected and exactly as he left it. But clearly that was not the case at all. He took a deep breath and reordered his thinking. It's just another wall, he told himself, and walls can be overcome. He turned back to Athena. Harsh odds never held me back before, my lady, he said. When the battle seems impossible, fight smarter, not harder. That's what my grandfather always told me. Athena smiled roguishly. Yes, she said. I always liked your grandfather. Tomorrow is the Feast of Apollo, where all the suitors will be gathered together in your great hall. Tonight I will plant a seed of an idea in your wife's head that will help you take advantage of that moment. You must find those who are loyal to you and do the rest. She leant forward and told him her plan. Odysseus smiled. Sometime later, an old beggar walked across the farmlands of Ithaca, 
to a small but well-built house. He was dressed in rags, and he had no shoes, his back was hunched, and he sang and mumbled to himself in a low, cracked voice. The beggar stumbled up to the door of the little house and knocked. Spare some alms for the poor, the cracked voice creaked. The door opened and a man stepped through. He was so big that he might have made a cyclops look twice. He held a large cleaver in one hand and there was blood on the other. The beggar took a step back, but a massive smile split the huge man's face and all of a sudden it was kind and warm and welcoming. Why, of course, stranger, said the bear of a man. I always have time for those in need. Please come inside. I've just been preparing a pig to eat and there's plenty to share. The man was Emmaus and he was the farmer in charge of all the pigs in the royal household of Ithaca. The beggar followed Emmaus into his house and looked around. What brings you to Ithaca, stranger? asked Emmaus, as the man set about preparing them some food. The feast of Apollo, my lord, the beggar replied. There are always alms given to the poor at great feasts, and the Ithacan throne has a reputation for generosity. I'm no lord, said Emmaus, barking back a laugh. I'm not but a humble pig farmer. No, I'm no lord, but I served a good one here, and you're right about the reputation of the throne. At least you used to be. Used to be? croaked the beggar. Are they no longer generous? Queen Penelope is very generous, said Emmaus, but she is no longer free to be so. The house is overrun with men all cloying for her hand in marriage. They want to take her and with her the throne of Ithaca and I dread to think what lies in store for Prince Telemachus when that happens. Well, one of these suitors may be a better master, the beggar crooned. If the winds of fate are blowing in that direction, why not cozy up to a new lord and make the best of it? Like an arrow shot from a bow, Emmaus was on his feet and looming over the beggar. The grin was gone now, and there was menace in his eyes. Now you listen here. I was brought to this island as a slave when I was naught but a boy. I wasn't that far in age from King Odysseus, and the two of us played together as lads and became friends. I worked hard and stayed loyal, and he stayed loyal to me too. Eventually, he gave me my freedom and control of a third of his livestock and all of the lands they grazed on. When he left for war, he could have asked some lord or chieftain to look after his son, but he asked me, and I take that seriously. There is no better master, and I shall hear no talk of one neither, or you shall leave my home this instant. Emmaus! said the beggar, but there was no sign of creaking to his voice any more. It's me! Odysseus stood, straightening his back and looking Emmaus in the eye. The huge man looked gobsmacked and took a few steps back. Odysseus? he breathed. You're here! I'm sorry for the disguise, my old friend, Odysseus exclaimed, but I didn't know who I could trust. I should have known that you would always be loyal. Can you ever forgive me? Forgive, stammered the giant. Forgive. Well, of course! And running forward, he swept Odysseus up in a massive embrace that made his spine crack and his ribs creak. I am just so pleased that you're home after all these years. Odysseus hugged the man back. Me too, my friend. Me too. Now tell me, who else can I trust? Who else is loyal to the family and will fight to defend us? Well, there's a few guards and servants, I suppose, began Emmaus, counting them off on his fingers. There's Nanny Euryclea, of course. There's Philoetius, your cow herd. Oh, what about Melanthius, my goat herd? Interrupted Odysseus, and Emmaus's face turned sour. That little snot, the man began, sounding out each word, is a traitor of the highest order. He's been snuggling up to the suitors ever since they arrived, looking for an advancement. Not an ounce of loyalty in that man. Why, he'd step over his own mother for a... Odysseus never got to find out what he'd step over his own mother for, because at that moment a voice called in from the doorway. Uncle Emmaus, are you home? I thought I heard you talking. Oh, there you are. And Telemachus walked in. Odysseus stared at the young man before him. He was beautiful and he was perfect and he was his. He's tall, like his grandfather, came a thought in the back of his mind but he's got my eyes and nose. Unconsciously, Odysseus's hand felt his own nose, now broken more times than he could remember, but once, 
It had looked straight and proud like the one on the face he saw before him. Ah, hello, said Telemachus. I didn't mean to interrupt. Nice to meet you, stranger. Odysseus only stared. He couldn't find the voice, and even if he could, he couldn't find the words. What words could you say to the son you hadn't seen since you could hold him in one hand? Emmaus, sensing the mood, cleared his throat and stood awkwardly. I'll, um, uh, I'll give you to a moment, said the herdsman, and grabbing a thick cloak, he went outside, whistling tunelessly. Telemachus, seeing the big man's discomfort and beholding the staring stranger before him, was nonplussed. Do I know you, sir? he asked Odysseus, and he could hear Penelope's lilt and accent in the young man's voice. You sound just like her, Odysseus gasped. Sorry? asked Telemachus. Like who? Your mother. Odysseus stammered awkwardly. You sound just like your mother. Do I know you? Telemachus asked again, but this time there was more suspicion to the tone, and he stared at Odysseus's time-ravaged features. It's me, said Odysseus. Telemachus, it's me. I I'm home. Son. It was awkward. He'd imagined this moment a thousand thousand times and it had never been like this. But the words were out there now and Odysseus stood there, raw and desperate and completely defenceless to Telemachus's response. Please don't run, he begged the boy in his mind. Oh, please don't run from me. Tears began to prick his eyes and there was nothing but silence in the room between them. Telemachus was searching his face now, incredulity warring with hope on his features. He gave a small, breathless gasp, then half a smile. Then he spoke in a small, quavering voice. Father? He sounded much younger than his nearly twenty years, and Odysseus suddenly understood that his son was every bit as scared as he was, even more so. In that instant, he knew what to do. Crossing the room in a single stride, he folded the young man tightly in a hug, and they wept together. Not far away, in the centre of the island, the suitors were feasting and laughing as usual, but a current seemed to be moving through the room. One by one, the suitors would lean across their tables to pass a message to the next man and the next man and the next. From high up on her balcony, Penelope could see it start out from Antinous and Eurymachus and spread across the room like ripples in a pond. As each man got the news, he would look back at the two and nod. I don't know what that is thought Penelope, but it does not look good. It's time. She nodded to Euryclea, and they descended the staircase to the great hall together. At the bottom, she paused out of sight to set her spine and square her shoulders and make sure she was perfectly poised before walking out. When they entered the hall, the hubbub fell quiet. Don't lose your nerve now, she told herself. Stay strong. I have made my decision, she told the room. Tomorrow, at the Feast of Apollo, I will choose a husband. There was absolute silence in the hall. Barely a breath was audible, and Penelope was convinced they would hear her heartbeat racing through her chest. But she held her nerve and summoned Eurycleia forward. In the old woman's hands, she held a bow. But it wasn't just any bow. It was taller than a man and curved strangely both forwards and then back. It was made of pure black wood inlaid with horn and it had strange carvings up and down the edge. This bow belonged to my husband. As Apollo is the archer god, it seems only fitting that on his feast day whoever can string this bow and achieve a feat of prowess in archery shall win my hand. Immediately the silence was broken. There was uproar in the hall, with all the suitors clamouring to be heard at once. Eventually Antinous managed to be heard. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please! Gradually the room went silent, and he turned to Penelope. My lady Penelope, he began, do we have your word on it that this is no trick? Whoever can achieve this task will win your hand in marriage? Penelope met his eye, and a cool calm came over her as she held his predatory gaze. You have my word, Antinous. One way or another, tomorrow I will end the day with a husband. And with that, she turned and left the room as the suitors looked on.